Adolf Hitler neither finished school nor had any vocational training. He occasionally lived in homeless shelters or on the street. He refused to pursue a regular job. To this day, it seems inexplicable that he could come to power. Out of nowhere, Hitler became the Führer, leader of the German Reich, one of the most powerful men of the 20th century who brought the world to the brink of disaster and death to millions of people. The nation worshipped him and followed him blindly into the abyss. But during his lifetime, he kept his origins and his life secret. No one should know how or who he was. Hitler's contemporaries, from his birth to his death, flesh out the picture. Who was Hitler? October 1929, angry autumn after a beautiful summer, rain and calm weather, and something suffocating in the air, and it wasn't the weather. For the first time on the street, manure brown uniforms. Sebastian Hafner, journalist, memoirs. The SPD had won the German elections of 1928 and since then led a coalition government with the middle-class people's parties. This falls apart one year after the death of the liberal foreign minister over domestic policy differences. In 1930, Chancellor Brüning convinces President von Hindenburg to dissolve parliament and call for new elections 24 months early. Brüning is determined to govern with the help of the president, if necessary, without a majority. National Socialists were now sitting in Parliament. The rise of the party could no longer be overlooked. Ernst Nikisch, National Bolshevist, Hitler opponent. Following the example of Italy, at the end of the 1920s, movements which are called fascist are gaining strength all over Europe. In some Eastern European states, dictatorial governments rely on the support of such factions. A union of fascists is also established in the UK. A party demonstration in Manchester in 1934. Sir Oswald Mosley, founder British Union of Fascists. In 1930, unemployment had increased to 3,076,000, and the National Socialists then increased their MPs to 108, with a vote of 18%. Less than three years later, the National Socialist Party came to power. Unemployment had risen to 6,014,000. New Year's Order, December the 31st, 1931. The army of brown shirts has multiplied numerous times. The movement has suffered a great deal of blood sacrifice. Comrades, at the beginning of this year, I thank you for everything that you accomplished over the past year through dedicated work and self-sacrificing battles. You can enter the new year with joyful confidence proud of what you achieved in the year 1931. Adolf Hitler. After an internal party discussion in Munich on February the 2nd, 
Adolf Hitler decides to run in the first round of voting in the German presidential elections of March 1932. Diary, Berlin, February the 16th, 1932. What a strange country in which the presidency must be decided between Thälmann, Hitler or Hindenburg. Thea Sternheim, art collector and author. Again, it was the politics of toleration when the SPD asked its voters to vote for Hindenburg and how faithfully they followed. Golo Mann, son of Thomas and Katia Mann. Diary, Monday, February the 29th, 1932. Who will win? Henrietta Schneider, housekeeper. Election campaign flight, April 1932. Soon Hitler had sunk into morose apathy. He just sat there, staring gloomily out of the window, wads of cotton in his ears. A complete contrast to the glad hand extrovert man at Tempelhof. As the door of the aircraft was flung open, Hitler ducked out and immediately threw himself into his Führer pose. There he stood, bareheaded, upright and unsmiling, his hand raised in greeting. Sefton Delmer, British correspondent of the Daily Express in Berlin. <laughs> Diary. Weimar, April the 10th, 1932, Sunday. Second round of voting in German presidential election. Hindenburg finally elected over Hitler. Harry Graf Kessler, publicist and diplomat. In June 1932, Franz von Papen, on behalf of Reich President von Hindenburg, forms a right-wing conservative cabinet which is without a majority in Parliament. The new Chancellor hopes for the support of Hitler and, according to Hitler's demand, asks the Reich President to call new parliamentary elections on July the 31st. <laughs> Diary, May the 31st, 1932. Lotte is coming on Sunday. She's planning a trip with Karl to Westerland. Yesterday, Brüning resigned. Now what? Henrietta Schneider. The hero of Tannenberg, the hero of the German Republic, had a dull spirit, our grumpy field marshal with his robust conscience. With truly Germanic blind loyalty, he betrayed the pious chancellor to whom he owed his power. Brüning was fired. His successor, the comparatively liberal General von Schleicher, was soon the target of wild intrigue. Klaus Mann, son of Katja and Thomas Mann. For far too long, we had been content with laughing and joking about the house painter Hitler. <laughs> Karl Zuckmeier, German-Austrian dramatist. Diary, Sunday, the July the 31st, 1932. The hatred of the parties is awful. At 10 o'clock, the elections begin, without Wilhelm. He is plagued with neuralgia. Henrietta Schneider. The triumph of the National Socialists in the July elections of 1932 is a Pyrrhic victory. Diary, August the 1st, 1932. Election results. We have gained a little ground. Marxism has gained a great deal. Now we have to seize power and wipe out Marxism, either way. Hitler is also of this opinion. 
We won't get an absolute majority this way. Josef Goebbels. As almost all the major parties in the Reichstag want to bring down von Papen's government, Reich President von Hindenburg dissolves the newly elected parliament in September and calls new elections for November the 6th, 1932. In the German elections of November 1932, the NSDAP won 11.75 million votes, the SPD 7.25 million, and the KPD some 6 million. So together, both workers' parties were a lot stronger than the Nazis. Manus Sperber, Austrian writer and KPD member at the time. Many leftists believed that Hitler would never recover from this setback and had ceased to be a menace. Christopher Isherwood, British-American writer. January the 1st, 1933. Hitler was in a good mood that evening and talkative, like in the old days. Before he left, he added to his entry in the guest book. On the first day of the new year. Then he looked at me and said, with suppressed excitement, This year belongs to us. Ernst Hamstengel, head of the NSDAP Foreign Press Bureau. After Hindenburg had decided against Chancellor Brüning, the president turned his attention to the forces of the great agrarian heavy industry coalition that operated with Hitler against Brüning, his natural allies. He took their view of Hitler. The reconstruction and further expansion of the great agrarian and heavy industry positions of power was to be taken forward. But the power was not to be transferred to the National Socialism. Ernst Nikisch, journalist, national Bolshevist. Diary, Monday, January the 30th, 1933. Elsa came back from school with the cry, Heil Hitler! Then we knew Hitler had become German Chancellor at last. Henrietta Schneider. A fragment of film Produced using an early AGFA color film process, it shows thousands of extras recreating the torchlight procession through the Brandenburg Gate. It is supposed to remind viewers of January the 30th, 1933. That the Nazis are enemies, enemies for me and for everything dear to me, I was not for a moment mistaken about that. Where I was completely mistaken was how terrible an enemy they would become. Sebastian Hafner, The majority of his ministers were members of the German National People's Party. He utterly despised the party and was convinced that he would one day be able to rid himself of them. To be able to carry this out, he set one condition to which the German president also agreed. He wanted the power to order new elections. Ernst Nikisch. Speech in the Berlin Sportpalast, February the 10th, 1933. I cannot divest myself of my faith in my people and stand firmly by the conviction that the hour will come at last when the millions who curse us today will stand by us and with us will hail the new hard-won and painfully acquired German nation that we have created together, the new German Reich of greatness and power and glory and justice. Amen. 
unter Ehre, unter Kraft, unter Herrlichkeit und der Gerechtigkeit. Amen. Adolf Hitler, Reich Chancellor. The Reichstag elections of March the 5th are the last more or less free elections in the German Reich. On the streets, dissidents are terrorized by the SA. The terror that was felt everywhere interfered, of course, with free elections, but it influenced the results only slightly. Manus Sperber. In the elections, the NSDAP profits from the high turnout of 88.8%, gaining 43.9%. It has to form a coalition with the German National People's Party. But the majority of Germans don't want a parliamentary democracy either. The democratic parties remain clearly in the minority, because 12.3% of the voters cast their votes for the communists. March the 12th, 1933. Press dispatch. The office of the Reichstag sent the newly elected members an invitation to the opening session. According to a directive, the communist members of the assembly were not sent an invitation. Fossische Zeitung, newspaper. The Reichsregierung gab es daher nicht, durch dieses Ermächtigungsgesetz die Länder aufzuheben. Two days later, I was sitting in the Kroll Opera House, not as a Reichstag deputy. I was an observer, and on March the 23rd, 1933, I witnessed the Reichstag session in which the Enabling Act was passed by 441 votes to 94. Artur Axmann, member of the leadership of the Hitler Youth. With the so-called Enabling Act, Hitler demands extraordinary powers for himself and his government, thus paving the way for a dictatorship. The Social Democrats were the only members to vote against the Enabling Act. But despite my conviction that the Social Democrats had failed, I was not unimpressed by Veld's speech. Artur Axmann. Article 1 of the Act describes the transfer of legislative powers from Parliament to the Cabinet. The legislative and executive branches become one. Parliament has virtually abolished itself. Meine Herren, seit dem 30. Januar hat sich in Deutschland eine Umwälzung vollzogen, die in unserer Geschichte ein mit Recht als die nationale Revolution bezeichnet werden wird. Dass ein solcher geschichtlicher Vorgang jede Kampfhandlung, die und da auch von bedauerlichen Erscheinungen begleitet ist, liegt auf der Hand. He overrode the Constitution with the Constitution and thus won the fight for unlimited power in the first and decisive round. Lutz Graf Schwerin von Krosek, Finance Minister. Anyone who did not fight against the Hitler state effectively served it. Esther, Countess of Schwerin, East Prussian landowner. I, as a natural coward and endowed with an excruciating imagination, kept my mouth shut. Marie Louisa Kaschnitz, writer, notes. P. 
people cling to life, you could certainly go along with it, but you could also keep a low profile and become invisible. Order Schaefer, writer. Letter from prison, June the 7th, 1933. You know that imprisonment doesn't depress me at all. What could I really do outside at the moment? Shrug off the sad looks of the workers with a humiliated heart and sagging shoulders and tell them that I cannot change it either? It's better to be outwardly unfree and inwardly face the future with a proud soul. Julius Leber, SPD member of the Reichstag. The first improvised concentration camps are run by the SA and are then taken over by Himmler's SS, thus creating the SS state. At the Nuremberg Victory Rally in early September 1933, SA Chief of Staff Ernst Röhm is the most prominent party leader after Hitler and clearly his right-hand man. Röhm shows his loyalty to Hitler in public. Privately, however, he criticizes Hitler severely for his policy on the German army. Thanks to his instinct for power, Hitler is willing to believe the rumors spread by opponents of the powerful head of the SA that the leaders of the SA, with its four million members, are planning a coup. Diary, Berlin, June the 24th, 1934. Politically, it stinks. Nobody knows why exactly. A power struggle is impending between the SA and the SS. Erich Ebermeyer, writer. The differences of opinion between Röhm and Hitler, especially concerning the issue of the German army, escalate. Before the SA leadership, Röhm finally calls for the German army to be included in his command. Diary, Sunday, July the 1st, 1934. Mutiny of the SA leaders in Munich, with Rome at its head. Hitler himself helped arrest the gang and had them shot. Henrietta Schneider. On July the 2nd, Hitler announces the official end of the purge in which between 150 and 200 people were shot. Röhm was one of the last victims. He was shot on July the 2nd, 1934. Hans Frank, Bavarian Minister of Justice, Reich Legal Director. To crush the alleged revolt by Röhm, Adolf Hitler uses the services of the SS, whose leaders have already brought the police almost entirely under their command. The SS, which was formerly still affiliated with the SA, is rewarded for its murderous service. On July the 20th, 1934, Hitler decrees... In view of the great services of the SS, particularly in connection with the occurrences of June the 30th, 1934, I hereby promote them to a self-contained organization within the NSDAP. Adolf Hitler. With that, Hitler has forged the decisive weapon of his state. The SA becomes a kind of folklore club for the NSDAP. Hitler swore that only 77 people had been executed. It had been unavoidable that some were shot by accident. Like a certain Willi Schmidt in Munich, for example. The SS were in a hurry to shoot the first Willi Schmidt they could find, without court proceedings. You have to consider how many Willi Schmidts there were in Munich. Friedelin Wagner, granddaughter of Richard Wagner.
Diary, Berlin, August the 1st, 1934. At lunchtime, we drove to the Harlensee Baths. People are friendly and peaceful. Even the young people seem well-behaved here. The Berliner Zeitung newspaper published a bulletin at 8.30 this morning. Condition deteriorating, pulse weaker. So, the end is near. This death does not come at a good time. Erich Ebermeyer. The newspaper reports the following about the death of Hindenburg. The government has enacted the following law that is hereby announced. The office will be merged with that of the Chancellor, which means all authority of the President goes to the Führer and Chancellor Adolf Hitler. Karl Windschild, retired pastor. Ballenstedt, diary. Diary, Wednesday, October the 17th, 1934. A law has been made. Hitler will remain the leader of the German people for life. Henrietta Schneider. The magic formula, the Führer has ordered, the Führer wishes, the Führer accepts, the Führer forbids, or the Führer authorizes, became the completely new, legitimized method of authority to issue directives that nullified all existing forms of state life in Germany. Hans Frank. Arrived in Munich around eight and went to the Hofbräu house, which was very interesting. Hitler seemed so popular here as Mussolini was in Italy. John F. Kennedy, student, traveling in Europe, diary. At first, what surprised me was that most Germans, as far as I could see, didn't seem to mind that their personal freedoms had been taken away, that so much of their splendid culture was being destroyed, or soon became aware, to be sure, that in the background there lurked the terror of the Gestapo and the fear of the concentration camps. The vast majority did not seem unduly concerned with what had happened to a few communist, socialist, pacifists, defiant priests and pastors, and to the Jews. William Shirer, correspondent to the Universal News Service in Berlin. Departure for Cologne via Frankfurt. All towns are very attractive, showing that the Nordic races certainly seem superior to Latins. The Germans really are too good. John F. Kennedy, diary. I had to think a lot about the comments of an ordinary middle-aged Berlin woman. She said she went to all the ceremonies and stood near the front rows where the Führer walked by, but she was never able to see him because whenever he came near, her eyes filled with tears. Eric Kort, Department Head, Foreign Ministry. Hitler seemed modest, middle class, rather dull and self-conscious, yet with this strange tenderness and appealing helplessness. Martha Dodd, daughter of U.S. Ambassador William Dodd. In private, and we as personal bodyguards belong to his private life, he was uncomplicated. Rohush Misch. SS Bodyguard Regiment. Simple lower middle class life was not hard for him. It attracted a lot of empathy. It gave him a lot of credit for other unpopular decisions. Otherwise, his simple manner also had clear political intentions. He often emphasized 
If I'm simple and unpretentious, then my surroundings have to be pompous. That way, my simplicity appears even stronger. Albert Speer, the Kranzberg Protocol. Göring, who'd become fat and out of shape, seemed ridiculous in his fantasy uniforms and his love of medals and decorations. His greed for earthly goods turned him into a crook. Robert Coulondre, who served as an ambassador to Berlin in autumn 1938, wrote that of all Hitler's sinister buddies, he was still the best. Paul Stellin, Air Force attaché in the French Embassy in Berlin. It has been suggested many times that Hitler had unwavering faith in his old comrades. As far as the Reichsmarschall was concerned, this assumption is true, unfortunately. Heinz Guderian, commander of the 2nd Tank Division. For the rest of the evening, he told jokes about Goebbels and Goering. Do you know the difference between Goebbels and Goering? He asked, and when nobody could answer, he solved the riddle himself. Goebbels is the maximum amount of nonsense a man can utter in one hour, and Goering is the maximum amount of sheet metal a man can hang on his chest. Friedelind Wagner. Berlin, November 1937. In November, the hunting exhibition was opened by Reich Master Hunter Goering. Strong foreign participation contributed to its success, causing a sensation in Berlin and impressing the visiting guests from all over the world. Our French countrymen came in droves. Paul Stellin. He condemned the elegant passions of his lofty colleagues like hunting or horse racing. These were the last remnants of the feudal rule of the princes. He made fun of them a lot. Albert Speer. Hitler's evil spirit was Goebbels. Ernst Hampfstengel. On the same evening, I saw Goebbels for the first time. A small man with an overly big head on a child's body. He was surprisingly ugly. His defect, he has a club foot, barely lessened the antipathy that he aroused. He was, however, very intelligent and, after Hitler, the best public speaker in the party. Paul Stellin. I couldn't care less what people think, and I'll say this openly. Goebbels was an interesting man. I never disliked him. He was only dangerous towards the end. Sarah Leander, Swedish singer and actress. He was capable of recognizing the faults and weaknesses of the National Socialist system. But he wasn't courageous enough to point these out to Hitler. In front of Hitler, he was like Goering in Himmler, a little man. Heinz Guderian, Major General. Speech in Munich, March the 14th, 1936. With the confidence of a sleepwalker, I am following the path marked out by destiny for me. Adolf Hitler. Diary, Sunday, March the 16th, 1935. In the evening, we heard a proclamation to the German people by Dr. Goebbels. In answer to the adoption of two-year military service in France, Hitler has introduced compulsory military service in Germany. Jubilation in Berlin. Henrietta Schneider. Interview with Ward Price, correspondent for the Daily Mail, January the 17th, 1935. 
I know the horrors of war. No gains can compensate for the losses it brings. I have seen that war is not the highest form of bliss, but the contrary. I have witnessed only the deepest suffering. Hence, I can quite frankly state, Germany will never break the peace of its own accord. Adolf Hitler. I saw a sign on the shop door. Dogs and Jews not allowed. Edgar Furchtwanger. Diary. Sunday, September the 15th, 1935. On the radio tonight, they're announcing the outcome of today's resolutions in the Reichstag, that is to say, the laws that the NSDAP deputies have agreed on, the anti-Jewish laws. Marriage between Aryans and non-Aryans is forbidden. Karl Windschild, retired. Dem Reichstag die Annahme der Gesetze vor, die Ihnen Parteigenosse Reichstagspräsident Göring verlesen wird. Hinter allen drei Gesetzen steht die Partei und mit ihr und hinter ihr die deutsche Nation. Eheschließungen zwischen Juden und Staatsangehörigen Deutschen oder acht verwandten Blutes sind verboten. Diary, Berlin, December the 10th, 1935. The Genetic Health Act, or Sterilization Law, has been passed and envisages extensive examinations and tests for engaged couples before they get married. If things continue like this, we'll soon have a race of supermen. So far, there is no sign of this happening. Erich Ebermeyer. Before the end of Culture Week, I was once again in an aeroplane. And even from the air, I could see the mass of people inside the party buildings on Zeppelinfeld. On the way back from the airport, the boiling heat of this uniformed public festival suddenly enveloped me. Marching music, columns of men, swirling dust, swastika flags in all possible and impossible places, and the pavements brown with people. Paul Otto Schmidt, chief interpreter at the Foreign Ministry, experiences. The march past took four hours. He held his right arm out in the Nazi salute for literally the entire time. Afterwards, I asked him how he was able to do that. His answer? Willpower. Neville Henderson, British ambassador to Germany. Each time I noticed how enchanted people looked, their faces full of near-biblical devotion when they saw Hitler. As if delirious, they stretched out their arms and greeted him with screams and shouts of Heil. Paul Otto Schmidt. Over the years, the procedures at the Nuremberg rallies are canonized. The form, as Hitler expresses to Albert Speer in a debriefing of the party convention in 1938, must be an irreversible ritual for as long as he lives. Canonization would provide his potential successor with Hitler's borrowed charisma and become a liturgy of the Third Reich. On Friday, the 11th of March, 1938, Austrian radio broadcast a program of light music. It was 7.45 in the evening when the announcer suddenly interrupted. The chancellor was going to speak. Kurt Schuschnigg said 
that in order to avoid bloodshed, he would capitulate to Hitler's wishes. He ended his speech with the words, God protect Austria. Dr. Edward Bloch, the Hitler's family doctor, written in US exile, March the 15th, 1941. Apart from his resolve to bring all Teutonic races into the Reich, as so plainly described in Mein Kampf, Hitler had two reasons for wishing to absorb the Austrian Republic. It opened both the door of Czechoslovakia and the more spacious portals of southeastern Europe to Germany. Winston Churchill, the Second World War. If it is still claimed today that Hitler occupied Austria against the will of the Austrians, that doesn't coincide with my observations. Fritz Wiedemann, adjutant to Adolf Hitler. Hitler's speech from a balcony of the Habsburg Palace. As Führer and Chancellor of the German nation and Reich, I report before history the entry of my homeland into the German Reich. In das Deutsche Reich! On March the 25th, 1938, Hitler begins the last election campaign of his life. Hitler wants to confirm the annexation of Austria in a referendum. He estimates 80% will vote in favor of it in Austria. He's more than surprised when on the evening of April the 10th, the referendum results are announced. 99.75% have voted for the Anschluss, more than in the Old Reich. He's really very lonely, doesn't have any luck with women. He's too soft with them. Women don't like that. They need a man to lord it over them. Josef Goebbels, Diary. In October 1938, Willi Faust shoots Bellamy in the IFA studios in Berlin. speech to the Nazi Women's League in Nuremberg. There was a time when liberalism fought for the equal rights of women, but the faces of German women, of German girls, lacked hope. They were gloomy and sad. And today, today we see countless beaming, laughing faces. Adolf Hitler. He knew that he could have any number of women. He refused because he didn't know, as he said jokingly, whether they favoured him as a Reich Chancellor or as Adolf Hitler. Albert Speer. As for Eva Braun, no one outside the inner circles of the party and the SS knew of her until the last year of the war. Charles Bewley. Irish envoy extraordinary to Berlin, 1933 to 1939. Privately, Hitler was very nice. Eva Braun loved him very much, and he loved her. Hertha Schneider, friend of Eva Braun. Diary, November the 18th, 
1934. I don't want it to be my fault if he doesn't like me anymore. Eva Braun. For several months in the years 1934 and 1935, Eva Braun keeps a diary. The diary includes the period when she attempts suicide, probably to get Hitler to commit to her. Diary, March the 11th, 1935. If only I'd never met him. I'm in despair. I'm buying sleeping powders again. He only needs me for certain purposes. Nothing else is possible. When he says he loves me, he means it only at that moment. Eva Braun. That was when Eva Braun attempted her first suicide. This act of desperation moved Hitler deeply. Christa Schröder, Hitler's private secretary. Politically, she had no idea. You often heard Eva Braun complaining. I don't know anything. Everything's kept secret from me. Hitler had got used to his girlfriend's character, but he didn't give in to everything she wanted. She was subject to a lot of strict rules. When she danced, she did so secretly because Hitler disliked dancing. Christa Schröder. The efforts my wife and I made to encourage Hitler to take private dancing lessons weren't crowned with success. No, he said categorically. For a statesman, dancing is an undignified activity. All of these balls are purely a waste of time. And besides, the waltz is far too effeminate for a man. It's exactly this waltz mania that made me hate Vienna so much and how it contributed to the downfall of the Habsburg Empire. Ernst Hampfstengel, from 1937 in exile. Hitler maintains his publicly Spartan lifestyle in surroundings of not inconsiderable luxury. In addition to his private apartment in Munich, he also has a residence in the Alps on Obersalzberg. Unnoticed by the public, he builds up a fortune worth millions. I don't have any stocks. I don't own shares in any company. I don't earn dividends. Adolf Hitler in the Krupp Works, Essen, March the 27th, 1936. The Reich Finance Ministry declares that Hitler is no longer obliged to pay taxes due to his constitutional position. And as of 1934, Hitler no longer does so. When he had to make big decisions, he went up to Obersalzberg. Here, life was geared to his personal needs. Strolls around Obersalzberg Stopping in small guest houses gave him, as he said, the inner peace and confidence to make the decisions that surprised the world. Albert Speer. He didn't drink a drop of alcohol, never ate meat, didn't smoke. His asceticism was real and not artificial. Hans Frank. One of those present asked his personal physician whether the health of the Reich Chancellor forced him to keep such a strict diet. And he answered that his Spartan habits were mainly for psychological reasons. Gustav Mannerheim, Finnish Field Marshal. Incidentally, the Fuhrer tried to spoil the meat-eaters' enjoyment of their meal. 
Although he didn't want to convert anyone to vegetarianism, he suddenly began talking about how awful it was walking through an abattoir. Gertraud Traudeljunge, Hitler's private secretary. Enjoying meat, he said, triggered a desire for alcohol. And then again, alcohol stimulated smoking. And this was how one vice led to another. Nicotine was, in his opinion, even worse than alcohol. He actually toyed with the idea of totally banning smoking throughout Germany. The campaign would start with a skull and crossbones printed on the cigarette packet. Christa Schröder. Hitler is driven by the notion that he will only be granted a short life. My personal last will and testament, Berlin, May the 2nd, 1938. In the case of my death, I dispose that my remains be buried in the right-hand temple of the eternal guardhouse. My coffin should resemble the others, that my entire estate be left to the party. To Fräulein Eva Braun, Munich, a lifelong allowance of 1,000 marks per month. To my sister Angela Dresden, a lifelong allowance of 1,000 marks per month. To my sister Paula, Vienna, a lifelong allowance of 1,000 marks per month. To my stepbrother, Alois Hitler, the lump sum of 60,000 marks. To my trusted Julius Schaup, the lump sum of 10,000 marks and a lifelong monthly pension of 500 marks. I appoint the Master of the Treasury as executor of this testament. In the case of his death, Martin Bormann. Adolf Hitler. <laughs> 